and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I am talking to Rebecca Robinson an eating disorder survivor from bulimia, binge eating, and general disordered eating behaviors. Rebecca is also a content creator of the Instagram account at Binge Free and Beautiful, where she shares her recovery tips. Rebecca is also an advisor for BEAT, the UK's National Association for Eating Disorders, and prior to becoming an advisor, she volunteered for them for several years. Rebecca is also a counsellor in training, wishing to specialise in binge eating and trauma, which I'm thrilled to hear about because we absolutely need more therapists in this field. Rebecca's struggles with eating disorders began around the age of 15 years old, when she hit a challenging time in her personal and family life, these eating issues being exacerbated in the next few years to experiencing further trauma and PTSD symptoms around the age of 19. Rebecca continued to struggle with eating disorders and disordered eating for around the next eight years. Thankfully today, Rebecca is fully recovered and on a journey herself in supporting others. It hasn't always been an easy ride with lots of ups and downs along the way. In this episode, Rebecca is going to share her healing journey, explaining some of the factors that were fundamental to her own recovery process. I know that this is going to be a conversation that brings you much value and inspiration. Let's get to it. This episode is brought to you by the National Centre for Eating Disorders, the NC Fed. Does eating rule your life? If you struggle with control of food, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you want to speak in confidence to someone who fully understands your relationship with food, contact Sam at the National Centre for Eating Disorders. You will find our details online or call 0845 838 2040. We know everything there is to know about eating distress and all our practitioners are properly trained. The first simple step is to have a no obligation assessment where you can speak freely in confidence to someone who understands and who will be able to tell you what is keeping you stuck. You will not need to do anything else if you simply want to think about what we have to say. If eating rules your life, take that first brave step now and get in touch. 0845 838 2040 during the week or look us up at www.eating-disorders.org.uk. Hi Becca, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hi Harriet, thank you for having me here. So Becca, firstly, can I get you to introduce yourself to the listeners, please? Oh, yes. Okay. It's always um, a funny place to try and introduce such a long story. (laughs) So I currently work for BEAT, the eating disorder charity in the UK, supporting people on the helplines, and I'm training as a counsellor as well. And what kind of led me to getting that point is my own experience of having eating disorders. So I have kind of struggled with bulimia and binge eating for about sort of 10, 12 years. I would say that they consumed a lot of my life, interspersed with kind of other forms of disordered eating. So yeah, that's a very brief summary of me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Becca. And could you just say a little bit more, actually, I'm like really intrigued about the work you're doing at BEAT, because I know before we just went online, I was telling you about how I used to volunteer for them many years ago when you used to write letters to people. (laughs) That's how old I am as part of their self-help. I think it's called the self-help network. But yeah, could you tell us a little bit about kind of your a bit more about your role in BEAT and sort of what you're doing? Yeah, of course. So I work as a helpline advisor. I actually did volunteer with Beat as well for about two years, I think, before I started working for them. So what I do in my current role is I'm on the helplines. So people who are suffering or even carers who need a little bit of support or guidance, I'm on the helplines taking phone calls. I'm also supporting people on web chats. So again, that's kind of one-to-one support, but through instant messaging. So everything's a bit more digital these days. <laughs> And I also run the support groups 
online. So they run different support groups every single day. So I'll be there facilitating different groups and there'll be different themes that I'm supporting people with. So that's kind of the main points of my job, along with other little bits and bobs, but they're the key parts that I'm working on. Mm, Okay, and it sounds like such a valuable service that Beat provides. And Becca, I'd like to come back and talk in a minute a bit more about your story, but just while we're on the subject of Beat, have you found there's been a massive increase in calls sort of through the pandemic, post-pandemic? Has that been the sort of trend with Call Us to Your Helpline? Oh, absolutely. I think... I mean, don't quote me on these statistics being like exactly right, but I'm sure it's, I think since the pandemic, their demand increased by like 300%. It was something ridiculously large. And I mean, I was actually volunteering for them through the pandemic and since then transitioned into working for them. And the amount of paid employees that they've hired since the pandemic has skyrocketed. So there's definitely been a huge increase in demand for services. And I think that comes down to really throughout the pandemic, people who were on waiting lists for eating disorder support basically got pushed back because it wasn't seen as a priority through the pandemic. The NHS was focusing obviously on COVID and on everything that was happening there. So unfortunately, mental health in general, I think, got pushed back. And a lot of people who were maybe getting close to receiving treatment are now kind of back at square one waiting for that treatment um, again. And that's quite understandably quite demotivating for people and frustrating. So we are trying to support them in the meantime. And when people phone the helpline, I'm guessing it's part of your role, sort of like a kind of listening and supportive role. And then are you also signposting or kind of guiding people into the beat groups where appropriate? Or, you know, what do people, what can people expect if they phone the helpline? Yeah, so we're not actually a listening service, not like the Samaritans, which are there just to purely listen to people. We obviously do listen to people and support them and give them that emotional support. But primarily, we're like an action focused charity. So through listening and speaking to the caller or the chatter, we kind of are there to help them figure out what they feel they might need in their recovery or what they feel like they may need in supporting someone else in recovery. And then signposting them to other services or resources or our support groups that could be helpful for them so the idea is that everybody would leave the chat or the phone call with more of a focused plan in their mind of like this is what we're going to go away and work on to get a little bit closer to recovery so it's very proactive in the the approach Mm, gosh so interesting to hear about that And in terms of the support groups as well that are run by B, could you say a little bit more about the different kinds of support groups that you have? Yeah, of course. So they've actually recently changed them. So we have one group that runs every single day, every single night from eight till nine o'clock, which is a general support group. So anyone with any kind of disordered eating is welcome into that group. And then we have a different one that runs from quarter to seven till quarter to eight most nights so there's an anorexia support group a bulimia one a binge eating disorder group and they will all have a focus for that week so they might be working on body image or self-esteem so that that will be focused whereas the general group is just an open chat and recently we introduced two new groups which are an under 25s group and an over 25 groups just to kind of help people connect with others who might be like of a similar age group to them so yeah they seem to be doing quite well the new introductions but yeah that's Mm. you can find it all on the website but there's quite a few different ones to have a look at yeah it's such a fantastic resource you know because I guess as well for many people that are waiting for active treatment being able to access one of your support groups sounds just invaluable and it sounds as though they're not sort of therapy groups is that right but they've kind of got a therapeutic focus so there might be a topic that is quite relevant in terms of recovery yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're not a substitute for therapy. None of these services are designed to be like a substitute for professional therapy or support. They do seem to be really helpful for some people. I mean, everyone's different. But in having that kind of support in the meantime, whilst you maybe are waiting for professional support, or even if you are having therapy and, you know, you feel quite alone because eating disorders can be really isolating and 
I don't know, in my experience, I was very secretive about what I was going through. And some people can find it helpful to have that place online where you can go and speak to other people who do get it and there's less judgment there. So it really is like a peer support group. It's not so much me as the advisor supporting people, but I'm there to facilitate and guide. And then the other people in the group are supporting each other. Mm. Yeah, and it sounds so helpful. And I think we often sort of underestimate, don't we, the power of that peer support. I know from sort of running groups within the NHS that if people are offered some sort of group support, often their initial reaction, understandably, is terror, I think, to be in a group and feeling perhaps exposed and feeling quite vulnerable. But I find, and I don't know if you're finding this as well, that once people come into the group, actually, it's such a relief to be able to speak to other people that are going through the same thing. And it's great at reducing shame, just feeling understood and heard because of it's so isolating, isn't it, when you're living with an eating disorder? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I think you know, there can be that kind of nervous anxiety, what are you going to expect from a support group? But the BEAT support groups anyway, um, they're because they're all online, they're set up in like a chat format. So you can't actually see each other. And the reason we do that is really to, you know, protect people's identity and also to kind of remove any of that feeling of comparison that people that, you know, quite often happens in eating disorders. You might be looking at someone and thinking things about their appearance and comparing it to yourself and then feeling like you don't deserve to be there. So by removing any of that kind of visual side of it, it's just people there typing how they're feeling. So we can really focus on what thoughts people are having what feelings they're having and getting support for that and removing any of these other things that this comparison that may come in and interfere with getting that support mm. okay well, that's just so helpful to know actually and this is like a real bonus on the podcast I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize like I knew that you were connected with B as an advisor but I hadn't actually realized you were fully employed so it's so wonderful just to be able to sort of you know let people know about this you know the services that are provided because I'm sure a lot of people out there aren't aware and are just going to benefit from knowing about this so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm glad to sort of share what they do because obviously I work for BEAT, but I volunteered for them for a long time. I have so much respect for everything they do for people with eating disorders. And I think the services are really great and absolutely necessary at the moment. Yeah. Can I just ask a couple more questions in relation to BEAT before we get on to your story? (laughs) I'm going to start charging them. (laughs) I'm promoting you here. (laughs) So does BEAT offer support as well from children with eating disorders right up to, you know, people that may be retirement age or, you know, is it right across the lifespan? Yeah, we do offer support for anyone of any age. Of course, certain services may be more geared towards certain ages so we do have kind of some forms of email support which you know they're only funded from the government for a certain age I think it's 12 to 30 and that's like an email support and it can depend on the area where people are which again comes down to funding but all of the you know the helplines the web chat services the support groups all of those services which are nationwide they are for anyone of any age so we do have I I have spoken to people well into the 70s on the helpline. I have seen people in the support groups who are as young as like 11, 12 years old. You do tend to find, well, I have personally found that the younger people who are suffering tend to gravitate more towards the support groups, which is, I think, why we created that separation of the under 25s and over 25s. So people who were of a younger age could speak to other people who might also be in school. So they could talk about how it is living with an eating disorder in school and you know the challenges that faces and then people over 25 can maybe focus on other things that might be more about managing work and having children and a family with an eating disorder so yeah they are open to anyone Mm, okay and do you also get a lot of carers as well contacting the helpline and do you have any support groups for carers of people with eating disorders yeah we get a lot of carers contacting us I'd say quite a lot of carers tend to use the helpline more than the web chat service but yeah we get a lot of them and we do have quite a lot of carer resources available so we have a support group that runs every week on a Sunday night for carers in the same kind of format but Beats also created I think within like the last year they introduced it's called the pod it's like a e-learning platform specifically for carers 
So on there, you just register with your email. They have like lots of mini short kind of training videos to help carers understand a bit more about eating disorders. And then they also have, you know, like chat threads where if you're a carer, you can ask a question, you can answer questions from other carers there. And there are also different training courses that you can book onto, which would be, you know, for a limited time, it might be five to 12 weeks and you would sign up as a group so there'd be maybe there's another six people in your group and there'd be a beat advisor and they would be working through you know training workshops about how you as a carer can support the person who you're supporting who has an eating disorder and also get some kind of extra support yourself so there's quite a few different services available for carers if you are listening and you are a carer I'd recommend going to the e-learning platform because that's where everything is for carers. So you can kind of find any services that we have all in that one place and book on to whichever course you think would be, you know, supportive for you. Mm, okay. Well, thank you so much, Becca, for talking all about Beat. And I'll put like the contact details for Beat in the show notes. So if anyone's listening and they want to access any of those resources, you know, do go to the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really hope it's helpful for people. Mm. So, Becca, going back to your story, Am I right that you began to struggle with eating disorders around the, you know, what sort of age did you actually start sort of struggling with eating disorders? When did that happen for you? So I was about, I'd say about 15 when this, like, when I first started struggling with bulimia. And it was around the same time that, like, my parents were going through a divorce. It was quite a messy divorce, not in the sense that it was, you know, a lot of arguing and aggression or anything like that at home, but it was a very emotional time and it was you know it was a lot of it was a bit of a roller coaster of emotions for the family and you know looking back now I can see I was quite heavily involved in that with my mum and dad in a way that I don't feel I should have really been for a 15 year old I feel like I turned to bulimia at that point and I didn't actually ever you know diet before that point I had my usual kind of insecurities in my body like most kind of teenagers do but I'd never dieted I've never actively tried to lose weight there'd been dissatisfaction in my body there and even when I first started like purging I wasn't restricting and then binging and purging I was simply purging after meals and I think it was some kind of form of relief or release from something that I needed And then from the purging, it kind of then did lead into restriction and then binging. So it actually started with the purging, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, and it's really interesting for you to share that, because I know that the common narrative was often talked about by professionals on social media, etc., is that the restriction comes first, the dieting comes first, and then that often leads to maybe binging or purging or purging. But it's really interesting, I think, that you raise the point that for you, the purging actually came first and it sounds like it was more of an emotional function perhaps though at the time I'm wondering it probably would have been quite hard to put that into words yeah at the time I don't think I you know thought of it that way at all it's now kind of my thoughts looking back and I can see where that came from and I can also see how maybe that seed was planted in my mind to purge as a form of coping with emotions just in general because I growing up when I was very younger I did see certain family members purging I don't think this person had an actual eating disorder where Mm. they you know it was something they did regularly and I don't think they like restricted binged purged and anything and there was no kind of concern around weight at all there but I did on a few occasions see someone in my family purge and ask like oh what are you doing they said oh I don't feel very well and it just makes me feel better And I think just that like small little comment made me think, oh, well, okay, I'll purge and I'll feel better. Even though I might have been doing it in a completely different way to how my family member was doing, I think they actually physically felt like, you know, they had a stomach bug and they thought, well, if I'm sick, like I might feel better from that stomach bug. I didn't do it in that way, but I took that idea and kind of adapted it and used it as a way of coping with the emotions that were not making me feel very good. So I was trying to release the emotions to make me feel better. And that's quite like an interesting observation that I've had as I've gone through recovery and grown older and these memories have come back and I've realised how these things contributed towards me ending up having bulimia. 
Mm. You know, so interesting. And I guess as well, you know, for when anyone sort of 15 years old, you're, you know, just on the kind of very beginning early stages, aren't you, of moving more in towards adulthood, but you're still essentially a child. It's quite a challenging time. It's a time of real transition and pressure from school and, you know, life going off in different directions. And it sounds as though it probably would have been quite difficult to sort of perhaps tune into the emotions that you were feeling, do you think, at the time that, you know, you had a sense that the purging was offering the release. But do you think if your 15 year old self had been asked how you were feeling with everything that was going on in your life, do you think you would have been able to identify what was going on at that point? Oh, no, not at all. I think Mm. I look back at myself now, you know, as that sort of teenager going through that. And I feel really quite sad for myself because I was just so lost, like really, really lost. I didn't, I couldn't really connect to any of my emotions. Like everything that was my reality growing up suddenly changed through Mm. a divorce. And I know divorce is quite common now, but it still is Mm. a huge life change to go through. And just that kind of everything I knew being different, I don't think I really then knew how I felt about anything. You know, I could have felt angry, I could have felt sad confused and couldn't really place any of them fully and allow myself to feel them it was just moment of chaos and feeling lost that's how I describe it when I look back at it and I think not just then not just as a 15 16 year old but through a lot of my late teens early 20s I look back and I feel like I was just so lost all the time I didn't really know what was going on in my life Mm. yeah and I thank you so much for sharing that because I think it's just extremely validating for people to hear that you know, because again, I think professionals will often talk about, you know, an eating disorder, it's a coping strategy, it's something to kind of, you know, a life raft that's kind of helping you through, you're kind of, you know, maybe you're using it as a way to to cope. But actually, when you're in the eye of the storm, and your life is in kind of chaos, you kind of at sea, you don't know what you're doing, you feel just very, very lost. It's not really a kind of conscious process, is it? You're just kind of in it. And it's really hard to see the wood for the trees and know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting you mentioned that about, you know, the coping mechanism, because I can now look back and see that I used it as a coping mechanism. But I remember being told this at the time. So around age 19, I actually, like after kind of, I already had bulimia, I'd gone through, you know, the changes in my family around 19, I was raped. And that's when like my bulimia really like took hold. And it was like, very consuming at that point. And I was having therapy, I was having counselling for like by a rape crisis team. Mm. And I remember trying to explain to the person who was supporting me, who admittedly wasn't an eating disorder professional, you know, I'm struggling with bulimia. And I knew it was bulimia because, you know, I, I was binging at that point. I was purging. I was using laxatives. I was very aware of what it was. And I remember her saying, well, it's just a coping mechanism. What we need to do is talk about the trauma talk about what happened and through talking eventually that will you know the bulimia will stop because you're only doing it as a coping mechanism Mm -hmm. and I remember feeling really frustrated by that because I felt really dismissed and like I wasn't really being listened to because I was asking for the support for the bulimia itself and I felt like I can appreciate that this might be a way of coping but by talking about what's happened isn't kind of you know stopping that from happening I want some kind of I want to focus a little bit on that and talk about why I might be using this as a coping mechanism and how I could use alternatives and what I can do about that. I kind of wanted to intertwine the two. Mm. And like I said, I appreciate the person who was working with me wasn't an eating disorder professional, so it was out of her depth. And and I know it can be hard. Like I speak to a lot of people at beat at the moment who do have these like comorbidities. So they're dealing with trauma and they're dealing with an eating disorder. And it seems from what I've heard from people like it's, not common to treat them together so people will be treated for trauma first and then the eating disorder but at the time that felt really frustrating for me because I didn't feel like you could really separate one from the other I felt like I needed to kind of address the two and then as I've gone through my recovery and now I look back I'm like okay I see what she meant it was a coping mechanism but at the time it didn't really feel helpful (laughs) Mm. so if you could sort of go back now I guess to your 19 year old self and you could almost be the counsellor for you that you needed like what 
other things would have been really helpful to have been included in some of those sessions? Mm -hmm. So it's a really good question. <laughs> and it's a huge question to answer, really, isn't it? Because yeah, it's a hard one because you can see maybe it's at the time, like focusing. I feel like my type of therapy I had was a lot of talking and that did really help me understand kind of cognitively what had gone on in terms of the trauma but I don't think it really helped me like in my kind of nervous system let go of it I think I would have appreciated at the time some kind of work which would have helped me with how the trauma was affecting my nervous system so I've done quite a lot of work myself on like trauma release exercises and somatic movement and kind of bringing the body into that healing so I think mm -hmm. that would have been helpful for me at the time in regards to the trauma. Mm -hmm. And I also think it would have been helpful, even because this person wasn't specialized in eating disorders, even if they'd signposted me to somewhere like Beat where I could have talked about the eating disorders or you know something else, whereas that wasn't even given to me. So then it did really feel like I didn't have anywhere to go with it. And I was felt quite left alone with it so even if they'd signposted me elsewhere to give me that support that would have been helpful but if she had felt able to talk to me about the eating disorder maybe just working on just talking about it like what made you want to binge that day and like how did you feel after purging and like kind of helping me understand like the connection to the trauma and how I was using it to cope would have been helpful because even that kind of aspect of it wasn't discussed it was just I was just kind of told it's a coping mechanism. It will go over time. I was kind of left with not much understanding of it. So I think just giving it a little bit more space and giving me a little bit of time to talk about it and maybe process it would have been helpful. Yeah, and no, thank you for sharing that. And I think it really just highlights the complexity really and the different areas that do require focus in eating disorder treatment. And of course, it's all going to be slightly different for each individual, but I think you raise a really relevant point that talking alone is probably not always going to help you overcome an eating disorder. Obviously, it's very valuable. I think I know definitely it's part of my work that I do with clients, helping someone understand their story. And we're starting to fit the pieces of the jigsaw together, understanding an eating disorder from a psychological perspective. It is really a valuable part of the treatment. But I think hearing what you're saying as well about kind of soothing your nervous system, kind of getting back into the body, releasing some of that trauma, and also the focus perhaps a bit more on the symptoms and perhaps understanding like, you know, what is a trigger for binging? How are you feeling before? How are you feeling afterwards? How's that relating to other things that are going on with your life? It's important, isn't it, to kind of probably have a bit of a balance really of the kind of working on those deeper issues, really understanding the core stuff, but also being able to kind of address symptoms and getting back into the body as well. And probably other things too, you know, it's not just those things, but it needs to be tackled from several different angles, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. When I look back at kind of my own recovery, because I feel like quite a lot of it was my own self like using self-help resources and trying things myself and you know I did have other therapy after the counseling and I think all of the therapy I had did help in some way yeah. and all of the things I did myself helped in some way so when I feel like when you think about recovery it's not just like one thing it's bringing in all these different things and they might heal certain parts of, of what's going on and together they all kind of a little pieces of the puzzle and like they sort of fit together and obviously as a counselor that's a I imagine as I'm training myself like a very challenging thing because you can't do everything <laughs> you can't yeah. be a specialist in everything and be able to provide everything for someone yeah it's definitely very very complex mm. so it sounds like different therapies that you had over time were really helpful you know you took different skills or different insights I guess from different you know different people that you worked with and that always really helped you on your journey but it sounds like as well a lot of the your sort of self-help has been a really important part of the process I think again that's such an important point to pick up on because I think for many of us as well we can be 
so looking out there in a way for the solutions and also for perhaps the perfect person who's going to scoop us up and fix us and make it all better. And gosh, how I wish there was that person, don't we all, (laughs) certain times. But I think, again, actually, it's a very empowering place when someone starts to take real responsibility for recovery and to start to really perhaps tune in to what's personally helpful for you and what's going to, you know, inspire you, what's going to give you hope, what tools and resources are going to really resonate with you. So could you tell us a bit about the perhaps self-help things that have been particularly beneficial along the recovery road? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And I totally agree with what you, when you speak about like the empowering side of self-help and, you know, wanting people to save you. I think I did this for a very long time and I think I jumped very much into like relationship after relationship, looking for somebody to save me and fix all my problems. And it never worked because ultimately I do feel like change and recovery has to come from you for it to be like long lasting and I kind of recognized this when I first met my now partner and he had a very different approach to this and everything I went to speak to him about or talk to him about you know not even eating disorder related but problem wise he would just like reflect it back onto me and I would be like well I've not really had someone do this before kind of be like I'm here to support you but you're going to do the work (laughs) And it was frustrating at the beginning, (laughs) but also like ultimately like really, really helped me. It was like the, it felt like it was that last little bit I needed to push everything that I'd been working on in recovery and into place because then it all fell on me. And yeah, it was really, really helpful. In terms of like what self-help I did, I did use some CBT worksheets that I found on on the internet which were for people with disordered eating which is interesting because I did actually have CBT therapy through a professional at one point and didn't find that helpful but that was it was online so I was doing it online and I had a professional that would check in with me every week and I think the reason it wasn't helpful was more because it, it you know I was in sort of my early 20s at that point and it felt like it was very it was very body image related so I felt like it was quite geared at teenagers so there was a bit of a disconnect there for me anyway but then I did find CBT worksheets myself and I worked through them I sort of decided to set aside some time every morning to sit down and work through a different part of a worksheet and then try and implement it into my life that was really really helpful also kind of bringing in things like a lot of mindfulness so changing my lifestyle to bring in a lot more mindfulness really, really helped me. So that included bringing in like meditation, yoga as a practice. The yoga was really helpful for me in being able to connect with my body because I do feel like when you are binging and you're purging, there's quite a strong disconnect from the body. Like cognitively, I knew what was going on, but I felt quite disconnected from my body. So yoga really helped with that. Bringing in meditation helped because that helped that was a key part of helping me realize I wasn't just my thoughts. And then combining that with CBT was quite helpful. Also journaling, journaling has been like a huge help for me and something that I still do now if I feel overwhelmed or I can just feel like there's something bubbling in the background, I'll journal, get things out. And that's a really helpful release for me. So quite a few different things. And then also, like I mentioned earlier, like somatic kind of movement and trauma release exercises but that was more to help with any underlying feelings I had with the trauma rather than so much the eating disorder symptoms so quite a few different things and I'm sure there's other things as well but they're the ones that you know popped to my mind at the moment Mm. well thank you for sharing Becca and I just think you're a great example of someone who has really stepped into that empowered place, taken responsibility and really kind of got in the trenches with recovery and done the hard work because of, mm-hmm. you know, that is the reality of it, isn't it? I think, you know, sometimes we can go along for our therapy session every week and hopefully something that's really helpful. But the doing the like work every day like as you have been doing in your recovery and actually sort of you know taking the time to do those exercises to reflect to do that inner work that's the stuff that's really transformative isn't it yeah absolutely 
I think going back to what you said about, you know, you want someone to fix you. When I, I did that in relationships, I do acknowledge that to some extent, therapy probably didn't help me as much as it may do other people because I was almost wanting the therapist to just fix me. And, you know, it doesn't work like that. And then when I stepped into it myself, you know, no one else was going to fix me. It had to be me. And that was where I think the real kind of shift happened. But I do think some of the things from therapy earlier helped me get to a point where I could do that. And, you know, they did help me get develop some tools and some understanding so I could get to that point to do it myself. Yeah, sure. And I think, again, you just raised a great point how, because I think therapy, sometimes it can sow the seeds, can't it? Even if we're perhaps not completely ready at that point in time to use the skills, take on the tools, it sows the seeds and it gets us thinking in a much more psychological way. So even if you can feel at the time that you haven't made as much change as you would like to, you have sown some very valuable seeds that are probably going to have really given you a springboard for when you're feeling more in an empowered place and in a better place, perhaps to just devote some time and energy to doing some of that inner work yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I had hypnotherapy and that was a really helpful therapy for me in reducing purging so actually after having hypnotherapy I didn't really struggle with purging I still continue to struggle with binging and you know disordered eating but didn't really purge and a lot of the work we did in hypnotherapy was kind of about going back you know regression and speaking to my inner child and finding situations when was the first time I ever felt like I didn't have control and then speaking to myself in that state and whenever I first felt guilt or shame and then communicating to my inner child you know what I needed to hear in that moment and that was something that I then took away from hypnotherapy and and used myself in my own recovery so I got to the point where I was really sick of how this was affecting my life and I used the name Esmeralda to talk to my childhood version of Rebecca and I say like well what would Esmeralda do in this situation like how would you speak to Esmeralda in this situation and that really helped me so again I kind of took that concept from the therapy and then applied it to my own healing and if I hadn't had that therapy I don't know if I would have really took that idea and used it to help me work through things so there's definitely everything plays a role yeah no I'm so with you actually like we can learn from all these experiences can't we and I think you know, the point that's really coming through here as well is that there isn't a magic bullet really, is there? But actually, if we keep seeking out different avenues that are going to be helpful, we are going to probably take, you know, different things that are going to be so valuable from each thing. And we start to build our own kind of toolbox and we start to take the parts that really resonate with us as individuals and, you know, bring that all together and kind of, I guess, sort of integrate it and then be able to sort of take that forward in a way that's you know, meaningful to us personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really key thing with recovery because I think it's great to hear other people's stories, what's worked for them. I think it can, you know, lead to ideas about what might work for you and you can help you in some ways, sometimes piece bits of your own story together if you can relate to what other people share. So I think it's really powerful hearing other people's stories. But I do also ultimately think, you can't listen to somebody's story and find the solution from that because what worked for me might not work for someone else. And, you know, recovery really is so personal because how these problems and issues with food develop is also very personal. So there's not going to be one way that it develops and there's not going to be one solution to fix things. And also because, you know, eating disorders are so multifaceted. There's not really what I can say that oh this contributed and that contributed but there isn't one thing that created my eating disorder so like I had to realize there's not one thing causing it there can't be one thing to solve it either yeah no great just to hear you say all that out loud I think it's gonna be so helpful for so many people listening and something that just came into my mind then as well is I think sometimes you know we can listen to recovery stories we can see professionals etc cetera, etc cetera, and sometimes we can hear something several times can't we but then sometimes we have to be in the right place the right time to really hear it and take it on board and make it work for us that's an interesting thing as well isn't it sometimes that's quite unexplainable about why sometimes it's that moment in time and that voice or what we connect with but yeah it's you know people's breakthroughs or little wins come from all different things at all different times don't they and that's such an individual process yeah and 
I really like what you've mentioned there with, you know, it does depend on the time and where you are at, you know, emotionally, because I did mention that, you know, yoga really, really helped me. It did really help me. But at one point I did try it quite early on in my recovery and it didn't help me. And I think because of where I was at mentally, I almost used yoga as, oh, well, I'm not going to go to the gym and do like a really, really intense, you know, workout today, but I'll still do yoga. And I tried to fit it in as like still a form of movement. And then it didn't help me because I wasn't using yoga in a supportive way. So then, you know, years later, I did revisit yoga from a different headspace after I'd like practiced meditation and had a better cognitive understanding of what was going on. And I found it really, really healing and really powerful. But, you know, it really depended on where I was for that to work for me. So I would also say if anyone is kind of going through recovery, if you've tried something and it didn't work, or you didn't feel like it worked, you know, it, it might be something you can revisit later and it might help, or you might have learned something from that to then lead you into a therapy or some kind of self-help that will work. So it's about like never kind of discrediting anything that you've tried. Yeah, no, great point. Thank you for sharing that, Rebecca. So one thing I just wanted to pick up on as well, which I thought was so helpful, is how your partner was very reflective when you were talking about your problems and perhaps you were going to them looking for a solution but what was really helpful although you didn't realize it at the time was that they were kind of being very reflective and getting you to come up with the solutions and I'm thinking like in terms of like the more the animal model and being the dolphin who kind of listens asks open questions etc it sounds like your partner was quite a dolphin or was (laughs) is quite a dolphin that was really really helpful because I think Again, as a carer, we can be so tempted, can't we, to fix, to want to find a solution, to be very directive with great intentions. But just think so great that you raised the point, actually, in a way that when your partner was reflecting stuff back to you and you had to sort of go within and think about your solutions, although that didn't feel very comfortable, it was actually probably quite empowering and actually ultimately helpful and getting you towards your recovery goals. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that about that, you know, the new Mosley approach, because I've been doing some new Mosley training recently. And through it, I've been thinking, oh, my partner's been such a dolphin or such a St. Bernard <laughs> dog. He's always very calm. And very <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, when we first met, we actually weren't like, we were just friends to start. And I will say I was probably quite late on, like, in my recovery, I was sort of getting towards the end of my recovery when I met him. So I might have reacted differently if it was like, you know, many (laughs) years beforehand. I don't know. But he was particularly helpful in things like, you know, like the reassurance trap you can fall into where you're like, you know, and anyone who has an eating disorder or is supporting someone might be able to like relate to this when, you know, you're asking someone, oh, do I look fat in this? Or, you know, do my legs look big in this? And you're kind of asking for that reassurance from the other person. And I think everyone else who had been in my life, like my friends and family, quite understandably like no no you look great and it's a natural kind of response to want to go down that route and reassure somebody and my partner just didn't do that he'd be like why is that important for you and I'd be like I'm just asking you and he'd be like well I would like to know what makes you feel like that's necessary for us to talk about and I didn't have an answer so I then had to go away and be like right okay let, let's think about this <laughs> And it really, really helped me to have those kind of questions. (laughs) Mm. Well, brilliant. Well, I mean, it sounds wonderful, actually, that you chose well. (laughs) 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 Yeah, because it sounds like, you know, at that stage of where you were in your recovery, that's probably exactly what you needed. You know, it was really supportive of you, I guess, on your journey, wasn't it? Although you perhaps didn't realise it at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't sort of realise it straight away. A couple of arguments at the beginning and then I realized actually no this this is really good for me and I feel like it then kind of put some final pieces together for me so yeah very grateful to him <laughs> <laughs> so Becca where can people find you if they want to get in touch and you know find out you know more about I mean I'm thinking particularly I know obviously you're at beat so People might be kind of getting in touch with you via beat, but what about your kind of personal social media channels and things like that? Yeah, so obviously you can find me at beat. On social media, I am binge free and beautiful on Instagram. And that's it, really. I'm not a huge social media 
person I have a love hate relationship with social media so I've just got the Instagram but you can find me there and if anyone ever wants some support or you just want someone to talk to then you know my direct messages are always open for people so pop and say hi if that would feel supportive for you fantastic well Becca I'll make sure that I put your Instagram handle in the show notes and I'm sure that you will have people kind of getting in touch great well thank you for having me today it's been really lovely to chat to you yeah well thank you so much Becca I think I found this such an inspiring conversation actually because I think you just highlighted so many points that are so relevant for recovery and I think it's very inspirational how you have really come from a very dark place and have really stepped into a place of personal responsibility and empowerment and have really done the work you know in your recovery and you know it's an ongoing process isn't it as you and I've talked about so I just want to really thank you for your time and for sharing so openly really really appreciate it thank you Oh, well, thank you for having me here. It's been great to chat about things. And I always learn more about myself through having these conversations. So thanks for the opportunity to do that. Thanks, Becca. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. And do go and check out all of Rebecca's details in the show notes. If you're not following me already, do see me out on Instagram at the eating disorder therapist underscore. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you enjoy this podcast, I would be so grateful if you'd follow, rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners. Thank you so much for listening today and I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon. Mm-hmm.